I just want to start tonight by talking about one word. This is a word that I believe will change your life as much as any other word. Now, the greatest word, of course, is the name of Jesus. But beyond that, this word will make a huge difference in your life if used appropriately. In fact, if you use this word correctly, it will open up an entire vista of possibilities in your life never before known and give you access to the supernatural. This is a word some of us have a hard time saying, and I'll talk about that tonight. And this word is simply help, help. Or Lord, please help me. Let's read a couple of scriptures and then we'll have prayer and get right into this tonight. Help. Uh, Psalm 109 verse 26. Help me, Lord, my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. Psalm 121, 1 and 2, one of my favorite passages in scripture. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then Hebrews 13 and 6, grounding this in the New Testament. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit would do a work in every heart. From the back seat of the balcony to the front seat of the floor, I pray you would speak to us today. Lord, I'm going to say some words. They're very simple words tonight. But I pray as I speak, you would speak. And I pray you would say more than even I say tonight and profoundly touch our hearts. And remind us, Lord, please remind us tonight that you are our helper. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let me say as I start tonight, Christianity was never meant to be a do-it-yourself project. You know, we're in a do-it-yourself world. In fact, I've learned even, we moved into a new house this last year, an older house that we remodeled. And uh, Lisa, my wife, and I did a lot of things we couldn't have done 10 years ago because we now have YouTube. And so when we got to something we didn't know how to do, something to fix, something in the plumbing that the remodelers didn't get quite right, we'd look it up on YouTube. And sure enough, we just follow the instructions and we could get it done and we could do it ourselves. But I want to say to you, Christianity and living for Jesus is not a do-it-yourself project. God has designed that we must be in relationship with him in order to live according to his will. In fact, we simply can't live the Christian life by ourselves. This is God's design. Some people say Christianity is a crutch. I don't know about that, but I know this. I can't live for Jesus without the help of the living God. I need him. In myself, there's no good thing. And without him, I can do nothing. And so tonight as we start, I just want to remind you that Christianity is not do it yourself. Asking God to help you is how he is designed for you to live the Christian life. Now today I want to talk about three times in our lives when we really need help and how asking God for help in those moments of life can change us forever. The first time that, uh, or the first occasion when we really need help is when we feel like we're over our head. A lot of people in our world today feel overwhelmed, over, oh, over, oh, just almost overshadowed. They don't know what to do. They feel like they're living in the bottom of a well and don't know how to get out. Well, if you feel like you're over your head, the good news is when you cry out for help to God, when you're over your head, he will help you and bring you out. We know the occasion, of course, when the apostle Peter uh, sees Jesus walking on the water on the Sea of Galilee, and he says, Lord, if it's you, tell me, come to you. And Jesus said, come on. And Peter steps out of the boat and walks on the water to go to Jesus until he sees the waves and the wind and the storm, and then he begins to sink. In that moment of sinking, he is going down in the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is about 141 feet deep at its deepest point. And Peter was starting to sink in that sea. He was way, way over his head. But in that moment, he cried out, Jesus, save me, help me. And Jesus reached down, pulled him up out of the water, and got him back into the boat. 
There's sometimes in life when our ambitions, when our desires, when our journey take us over our head. I got to admit to you, and as uh, Pastor Joe shared, and some of the things I do in my life, I'm over my head every day. There's no way I should be a college president. I never dreamed I would be. It was the furthest thing from my mind 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And yet God has put me in this position and I try to serve it well. I have my doctorate, of course, and I love what I do and I love young people. But boy, I feel over my head just about every day. And I felt that way my entire ministry in life. I had a, a, a early life mentor that said to me one day, said, Billy, you'll never be worth anything until you get in over your head. So in life, many times our ambition, our desire, even our responsibility puts us in a place where we feel like we're over our head. The good news is, when you get out on the water, if you start to sink, God is ready. If you will ask him to help you, he will help you. He'll bring you up and you will not go to the bottom. Now, there's another reason some people are really overwhelmed and feel like they're sinking and over their head, and that is because of their own disobedience and sin. An account in the Bible of a guy named Jonah, he was a prophet, he was called by God but he was disobedient. God said, I want you to go to the biggest city in the world and preach, and he said, no way. He ran the other direction. He got a ticket going to the ends of the earth. He got in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and a storm came up, and the guys on the boat said, we don't know what's going on, and finally Jonah said to them, hey, I'm the problem. If you throw me into the water, the storm will stop. Sometimes storms are not from the devil. Sometimes storms are allowed by God to get us back on course. Boy, that was a word for somebody, but anyway. So reluctantly, they throw Jonah into the Mediterranean Sea. Now, it's important to note the Gal Sea of Galilee is 141 feet deep, but the Mediterranean Sea it's at, at its deepest point is 17,000 feet deep. Jonah falls into the water. We know the account in Scripture in the book of Jonah. God prepared a great fish or a whale that swallowed him up. And when the fish swallowed him up, the fish swam to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. You're talking about being over your head 17,000 feet down without any pressurization except the belly of a whale. But in that moment, Jonah cries out for help. Here's what scripture says. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me from deep in the realm of the dead. I called for help and you listened to my cry. Wow, 17,000 feet under and he cried for help. God heard him, of course, and all the while the fish went to the bottom but was swimming back toward the shore near the place of Nineveh. And when Jonah cried for help, God caused the fish to regurgitate him and spit him out. And he landed on dry ground and God said again, go to Nineveh. And he said, yes, sir, I'm ready to go. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed in life. Sometimes we feel like we're at the bottom. Sometimes we feel like there's no way out and darkness has surrounded us because of our own disobedience. We miss God. We didn't do what he wanted us to do and we went against his word and against his will. But I wanna tell you, if that's the case with you tonight and you're feeling overwhelmed even by your disobedience and you know you blew it and you know you should have done something that you didn't do or you did something that you should not have done and you feel overwhelmed and depressed, don't be, you can cry out to God in your distress, he will hear you and bring you up again and restore you to his will. Help, help Lord, help. Second occasion when we need to ask for help is when things are not going well at home. When things are not going well at home. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, no one can put a sign in front of their home that says, nothing is wrong here. I like that one, huh? We're all part of families and every family has moments of struggle. Well, we see over and over again in the New Testament when things were not great at home and people asked for help, Jesus helped them. One of the occasions is found in Matthew 15. It's about a Gentile woman, a Canaanite woman, whose daughter is grievously overwhelmed and abused and even possessed by an evil spirit. 
and she can't get victory over it. She, she's troubled about her daughter. One of the things that will make you pray, I have two children and seven grandchildren. One of the things that will make you pray is when things are not going well with your children or even your grandchildren. And so this mother comes to Jesus and said, Lord, I need your help. She falls down. She asks for his help. He said, uh, he first ignores her. Then he says, it wouldn't be right for me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. And she said, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. She had cried out to Jesus in her distress, Lord, help me. And her daughter was delivered. Another occasion, this time a son. You know, you think daughters will give you a heartache. Well, sons can too. Yep. How many of you know that? No, don't raise your hand in case your child is here. But this son also was possessed with the devil. And, and the dad brought him to the disciples hoping that they could get the victory over this. What would happen is the boy at seasons would be uncontrollable. And the spirit would throw him into the water or throw him into the fire. And he, he couldn't get free from it. And the dad was totally distraught. And he brought the boy to the to disciples, to the apostles, and they couldn't cast the devil out of him. There was no help. Jesus coming down from a mountain of being transfigured in the glory of God sees the crowd gathered and asks what's going on. At that point, the father says this, the spirit has thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And when he said that, God delivered through Jesus Christ his son and set him free by the power of God. How many of you ever seen your children touched by God's power supernaturally? You've been in distress. Maybe your child was sick. Maybe they had some kind of uh, debilitating disease or sickness or situation, and God came through and delivered them. My own children, who are adults now, and one has four children of their own and the other has three, have had all kinds of moments in life when we needed God's help. When you need God's help in your family, God will hear you and he will answer you if you will ask him. The if you will ask him is the big part. Many times we try to fight through it ourselves and get through the struggle. And God all the while is saying, you don't have because you don't ask. If you would simply ask me, I would help you in your family and minister to your children. Last year, uh, my daughter had their last child. They think it's the number four. <laughs> They've, anyway, I won't go into all that, but they hope this is the last. So this one was a surprise. And... Um, Benjamin came early. In fact, he was about five weeks early. And he was in bad shape when he was born. He was very, very frail, small. His lungs weren't functioning great. And he was in the hospital. He just had his first birthday uh, this Saturday, this past Saturday. And as I sat watching him play on the floor and beginning his first steps now, he's walking about three at a time and starting to talk a little bit. He says, Nana, better than Papa. I don't like that. But anyway, it's all right. And, uh, and watched him, I thought, wow, what a difference a year makes. Last year at this time, we were on our face crying out to God, saying, Lord, please help us and please help Benjamin. And you know what? God did. Come on, give God praise right there. Give him praise. Wow. My own family growing up, I saw what God can do in a family. Uh, some of you know my story, but most of you probably do not. I was raised in a preacher's home or born to a preacher's home. My dad was a supervisor in a denomination, and at the age of five, he came in and told my mom he was leaving, and he did. My mom and my two sisters and I moved in with my grandparents in western Kentucky, and I lived with them for the next 15 years of my life. I had all the marks of a child of a broken home. By the time I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I was bitter, I was angry. My dad was public enemy number one. I couldn't understand what had happened, how he could have treated me that way and abandoned me, and it was all about me, of course. And uh, I was looking for something to, to heal that up. I got into all kinds of mess as a teenager, and then at the age of 16, I was radically, radically saved. I gave my heart to Jesus. I begged him to forgive me of my sins, and he did, and he changed my life. And then he began to work on my heart and say, you know, Billy, if I could forgive you of your mess, why can't you forgive your dad of his mess? 
Nobody taught on that much back in those days, but God taught me on that. And then my dad came back to the Lord. He got far away from God. He and mom married again. They were both in a mess. Mom was uh, doing everything she was big enough to do. Dad was in all kinds of relationship problems. And he came back to the Lord and got right with God. Left the woman that uh, he had lived with for a few years and started serving the Lord again. And he and I began to develop a relationship some after I was saved. I went on a trip with him, and, which was a delight for me, really the first journey ever uh, with my father. And it was great. I received a personal prophecy on that trip that I would preach the gospel all over the world, which scared me to death as a 16-year-old. But it's come to pass. I've preached now in uh, 98 nations personally. That was a good prophecy. Yeah, that was a true one. So dad began to serve the Lord. He went to Florida and tried to start a church. He did ultimately plant a church in a little community down there, very um, humble, very meager, lived in a small trailer. And um, at 19, just as I was turning 20, I got married to my wife, Lisa. It's been a wonderful journey, 43 years, and so that's been exciting and wonderful, and I'm so grateful for Lisa. And um, we got married in June, and uh, during... Uh, The months before that, I got this inescapable burden for my mother. She was far away from God, very bitter in her heart, and she had gotten out of the other marriage she'd been in for just a little while, and again, just searching, looking, angry, hurting. And I was at an altar one night praying for my mom and just crying out, God, please save mom. She needs you so much. And it was was a burden that was crushing, really, for me as, as the son of the family, and That night I saw a vision of my mom. She was wearing white and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was at an altar right here just kneeling. And the Lord spoke to me and said, everything's going to be okay with your mom. And so I went home and told her. I said, Mom, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But God told me tonight it's going to be all right and you're going to be all right. She would say later on those words haunted her day after day after day. I didn't know that. So Lisa and I were married, and about uh, three or four weeks after we were married, Mom was at work one day, and the Holy Spirit fell in her office, a little furniture store she was working at as the uh, clerk and tax person and all of this. And the Holy Spirit fell in the office, and she started crying, and the Holy Spirit said to her, Today is your day, Joyce, and I've come to touch your life. And so she called a friend. She said, Could you meet me at church? Something's happening. Her friend said, Sure. It wasn't a church day. It wasn't a Sunday I, they got in the church some way. They found themselves at the altar. Mom got down and asked God to forgive her. God did. God changed her from the inside out. And all of this bitterness and anger and all of this got washed away in the blood of Jesus. She got up from the altar. She got up from the altar and she told my sister Donna, who had heard about mom being at the church and got there. Donna's about five or six years older than me. And, and she said, I've got to go find your dad. And uh, mom was in Owensboro, Kentucky, and she got in a car and drove down to Brooksville, I think it was called, Florida. A long, long drive, about 10, 11 hours. And she got there. She knocked on the little trailer where my dad was living on the door. They hadn't seen each other in several years. Dad came to the door and said, Joyce, I've been expecting you. And she said to him, she said, I I need you to forgive me. He said, no, I need you to forgive me. And uh, two weeks later, they were married again. And the last 35 years of my dad's life, they were spent in full-time ministry, and dad ministered to hurting preachers a lot, as well as pastoring and ministering and traveling. And he had about 200 spiritual sons at his funeral uh, who were preachers all across the country who had been hurting, and they'd stepped in and loved them. Dad became one of my best friends. He became my chief cheerleader. God honored me and let me be at his bedside when he died. And uh, singing songs that he loved, he was in a coma, he opened his eyes, looked at me, and went home to be with Jesus. He had spent, uh, about a month before that, I got to spend an entire day with him. And that day, while I was with him, my dad said to me, no less than 150 times, Billy, I love you. And all those years that I didn't hear that, God helped me hear it a lot in one day. He would say, hey, 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 Billy, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. And God healed my heart up and and made things well. So what I'm here to say to you is this, that if you'll ask God, if you'll keep seeking God, if you'll keep crying out to God. Now, I don't suppose everyone's situation is going to be like my mom and dad. 
Every marriage is not going to be reconciled. Every marriage is not going to come back together. I know that, but I want to tell you, God can do all things and he can help your heart and release the bitterness and heal you from the inside out. Come on, come on, give God praise. Nothing, nothing is impossible with him. And when you cry to God, help. When you say, I need help, he says, that's what I've been waiting for. You just opened the door to the supernatural and angels and dynamic and the power of the spirit come into the situation and God brings healing. Wow, wow, wow. Somebody in this room, you're having problems right now in your marriage. You're struggling. You're trying to get through it yourself. You're putting on a stiff upper lip. You're trying to make it through the moment. God says, no, 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 this is not a do-it-yourself thing. Why don't you just ask me to help? Why don't you ask for my help, God says. If you'll ask me to help, I'll help you first. I'll help your mate. I'll help your children. I'll come in and make a difference in your family. Wow. Wow. Wow, come on, give God praise. (laughs) Man, I need to stay right here just a minute. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit can do more than cards or flowers or candy can ever do for your marriage. If you'll bow down together as a couple and say, Lord, help us, we need your help, and open your home up to the Holy Spirit, he'll bring healing, he'll bring love, he'll bring peace, he'll bring grace, he'll bring patience, he'll bring his goodness. Come on, give God praise. Wow. So... Ask God for help when you feel overwhelmed. Ask God for help when you need help in your family. And finally tonight, ask God for help when you're struggling to be free. Exodus 3.23 says, During that long period, the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. Their cry for help went up to God. To God. When the cry of the Israelites because of the Egyptian captivity and the bondage they were in reached heaven, help came down. Now help came in a very unusual way. Uh, there weren't chariots and horses riding into Egypt setting them free. Help came down in a fire in a bush on the backside of the desert. But when you cry for help, when your cry for help goes up, then help is coming down. And out of that fire, God says to Moses, I want you to go and deliver my people out of the bondage of Egypt because I have heard their cry and their groaning. I've heard them crying for help and I am sending you as a help to them so they can be free. When we are in bondage and circumstances that are keeping us from our destiny and future, then it is time to cry out for help. And who knows, when you cry out for help in your bondage and God helps you, then he's going to help others that are watching you and he's going to use your witness to help others get free as well. I believe that in this moment, in this time that we're living in, so many people have found themselves in a tangled web of spiritual bondage and all they need to do is cry out for God to help them and consistently do so and God will help you and he will set you free. I found a very unique story a few years, a few weeks ago actually and shared it a little bit a few days ago. Pearl Harbor was one of the great tragedies in America. On Pearl Harbor Day, 19 ships were lost in Hawaii. 2,400 or more personnel died, 68 civilians. And after that battle, President Roosevelt, FDR, wanted to strike back against Japan. And ultimately, after first his um, cabinet said it can't be done, and he said, don't tell me it can't be done. I'm president and I can't walk. Don't tell me it can't be done. They devised a plan called the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid happened actually on April the 18th where 16 B-25 bombers were put on the Hornet, uh, USS Hornet uh, uh, aircraft carrier. Now the problem was the B-25 bomber could barely take off from the aircraft carrier and the deck was too small for the bomber to land back on, shore, or back on the boat. So what was going to happen is they were going to get close to the, to the island of Japan They were going to fly off the deck of the Hornet. They were going to bomb Japan and then they were going to land in China because they couldn't land back on the boat. 
They'd gotten permission from the Chinese to land in their area. And it was a very, very dangerous mission. So when they told the volunteers of the 17th Bombardment Group in the Air Force what they were doing, they said, we want you to know you may not come back and you may lose your life. And 80 of them volunteered for the mission, 16 planes with five crew each. They made their run. They flew over Japan. You can see here, the boat on the right would have been the Hornet. They flew over Tokyo. They bombed Tokyo. They bombed Nagoya, Osaka, and Kobe. One plane veered off and, and landed in Russia because it was running out of gas. They had been in some weather situations. They had to fly further than they wanted to. And the other planes made their way toward the shores of China in the middle of night by the time they got there. Most of them did not make it. Several of them crashed at sea. Some of them crashed on land. One plane, I think, landed safely. And then the plane in the USSR landed and was and compounded because the Russians would not give permission uh, for the U.S. to be there. Out of the 80 uh, airmen, I think four of them lost their life in the crashes that happened uh, either in China or off the shore of China. Uh, I think there were eight of them also then, uh, four of them lost their lives. Eight of them were captured by the Japanese because they landed in areas of China that were inhabited by the Japanese and were under occupation. Out of those eight that were captured, three of them were executed at the firing squad almost immediately. One of them died in prison by starvation months later. And four of them were kept in prison camp throughout the war. The emperor of Japan commuted their sentence from, from death to life and imprisonment, and they were actually in a prison camp in Russia at one point and several other places. One of the soldiers that was in prison for this entire time, 40 whole months, by the way, from the time they were captured until they were released, spent 34 of those months in total isolation. His name was Jacob de Shazir. Mr. Shazir, Lieutenant Colonel Shazir, as he would be known, uh, was an atheist when the war began, and he was an atheist when he took this journey on the Doolittle Raid. He didn't know God, and he didn't plan on knowing God. But something happened to him in the prison camp under the Japanese occupation. And while he was a prisoner, he knew he needed help. So he learned a few phrases of the Japanese language in order to communicate with his captors. Finally, he learned enough of the language that he asked one of the prison guards, could you please find me an English Bible? The prison guard smuggled a Bible to him and said, I can only give you this for one month. The people need it back after one month. And for one month, Jacob de Shazir read God's word and in the middle of all that, gave his heart to Jesus Christ and became a convert. Yeah, I give God praise, amazing. And out of his captivity, he found Jesus. Well, when he got home after the war, he was finally released by American forces. He got home after the war. He went to school to be a missionary. And after school, after learning and, and getting his uh, education, he went back with his wife to Japan to be a missionary. Ultimately, he would go all the way to Nagoya. He was on one of the flight crews that bombed Nagoya, Japan. He went back to Nagoya and established a church in the very city that he bombed. Wow, that's right. But the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, is what else happened. There was a track written about De Shazir's experience. The track was called, I Was a Prisoner of Japan. A man by the name of Mitsuo Fushida read this track. Now, Mitsuo Fushida was a very famous name in Japan because he was the pilot that was the lead attack pilot on Pearl Harbor. In fact, if you've seen the old movie, Tora, Tora, Tori, he is the pilot that was, a, that was allowed to break radio silence and cry out, Tora, 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 which meant they had had a successful raid. He was the hero of Pearl Harbor. So when he got back to Japan, he was a folk hero. He was decorated. He was a household name. Everybody knew Mitsuo Fushida. Well, Mitsuo Fushida got a hold of the track about Jacob de Shazir called I Was a Prisoner of Japan. And the pilot who led the raid on Pearl Harbor found Jesus because of the testimony of de Shazir who found Jesus in a Japanese prison camp. And Mitsuo Fushida became a missionary himself spending most of his life in the United States preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and at one point, 
Deshazir and Fushida preached together as Christian missionaries in Japan for the glory of God. Now listen, when you are in prison, when you are in bondage, when your circumstances have you locked up, when you are there because of your own failure or not, if you will ask for help, uh, uh, Deshazir found enough grace to ask that guard, that Japanese guard, his enemy, to help him. And when he did, he opened up a whole world of possibilities and God says, I can use that. I'll change his life. I'll make him a missionary and I'll use him to get the man that led the raid on Pearl Harbor saved. Come on, give God praise. Wow. (laughs) Here's what God's word says, Psalm 107, verse 10 through 14, and I'm getting ready to close in a moment. Some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness. He broke away their chains. Well, Dr. Wilson, if it's so easy to ask for help, why don't people ask for help from God more? Well, some of us have a real hard time asking for help. Gentlemen, we especially have a hard time asking for help. I'm really glad for uh, Siri and GPS and, yeah, isn't that awesome, guys? It's awesome. We don't have to stop and ask for help anymore. We just keep talking to that machine until it gets us to where we need to be. It's fantastic. Because we always had a hard time asking for directions, asking for help. In fact, statistics say that many men die from cancer because they wait too long to ask for help. Many men crumble because of mental illness because they simply won't ask anyone to help them. They just don't want to ask for help. But why? Why is it? Why is it that I struggle to ask for help when it's so powerful, when it opens such an amazing door? Why do I struggle to ask for help? Well, I'll give you seven reasons real quick. Number one, some people don't know how to ask for help or they say they don't. I meet people like this all the time. You know, we travel all over the world and every now and then I meet someone that they say to me, I don't know how to pray. Billy, I don't know how to pray. I look back at them and I say, you don't have to pray any certain way. You don't get any further for God by saying certain phrases and you know, quoting the King James Version when you pray. God just wants you to have a conversation with him. He just wants you to open up. And I say to them, hey, you're talking to me. You can talk to God. Just talk to him. Don't be afraid to ask God to help. You don't have to know how. Just say help. Number two, we believe we're the only ones with the problem. We think we're an island that we've, the only ones ever went through this. That's not true. There's no temptation given to men that, but it's such as common. We've all gone through things. Number three, we're afraid of rejection. We've been rejected by others. We're afraid that God himself will reject us if we ask for help. Number four, we don't want to face the truth sometimes. So we don't want to ask for help because we don't want to admit we're in a bad situation and we need God. We need help. We're in denial. Number five, we've, conditioned, we've been conditioned by our world to handle things ourselves. Don't cry. Be tough. So we struggle with that. We, we think, well, I need God, but I think I can handle it. And number six, one of the reasons we don't ask for help is because we are harboring resentment and bitterness in our heart. It's hard to ask someone for help that you're angry about against. And some people are just angry with God. So it's really hard to ask him to help them when they're angry with him. Listen to this scripture in Job. This, I found this a few days ago. It's amazing. The godless in heart harbor resent, resentment. Even when he fetters them, even when they get in trouble, they do not cry for help. The godless in heart hold resentment and bitterness so much that when they get in trouble, they still don't ask for help. I invite you to lay your bitterness down. Lay your bitterness, your resentment aside and ask God to help you. And then finally, of course, most importantly, we don't ask for help because we're just too proud. Humility is hard to define. We know it when we encounter it in others, but sometimes it's hard identifying it in ourselves. What does this word mean? Humility. Humility comes from a root word that means laying low, lying low, close to the ground, not haughty or uppity. 
emptying ourselves of ourselves, coming down. When we humble ourselves, you know, that's what this asking for help is all about. Why is asking for help so powerful? Because it represents humility. And when you humble yourself, God is drawn to humility and will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Christianity is not a do-it-yourself religion, but it's also not a religion you can live out with pride. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to be willing to ask for help. Almost two years ago now, in May of 2020, as the pandemic started to rage around the world, I was in my prayer closet praying one morning, and one of my favorite scriptures in the world is Habakkuk 2.14. For the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I love this, this word picture, that there's an overflow of the glory and the knowledge of his glory, and it covers the world like the waters cover the sea until there's no dry place anywhere. I love this passage. I wish I could preach on it tonight, but not right now. And that particular morning, I kept reading on. Now, I'd read this passage before, but I'd never noticed it like I did that morning, trying to cope with a pandemic on a college campus and around the world with all of my friends being so impacted in their ministries. And I saw this verse in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 5. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood, he shook the earth. He looked, he made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age old hills collapsed, but he marches on forever. And for some reason, when I read that that morning, this one little piece of that verse, plague went before him, jumped out. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in my prayer closet that day and said, that's what's happening. This plague is going before me. And when it's over, I'm coming after it in a big way. In other words, the plague was going to prepare the way for a new move of God in the earth is what God gave me that morning. Oh yeah, come on, give God praise. COVID-19 and the coronavirus has been unlike anything, of course, in our lifetime. But maybe anything ever, because we know now what has happened and because of the commerce of the world and the migration of peoples and the traveling of peoples, every nation on the planet, I think even some of the very small island nations have now been touched one way or the other by the pandemic. Nothing ever could have done that. Nothing. If there was a nuclear bomb go off in Russia today or in the Ukraine or somewhere like that, it would not touch the entire world. Now, it would be on the newspaper, but the fallout would not reach some of these places around the world. But this pandemic has reached all around the world. In fact, I heard the other day that if you put all the virus of COVID-19 together, it would be about the size of a Coke can. All of the molecules of this virus stuffed together around the world with six something million people dying from it, stuffed together would be in a Coke can and that Coke can full of virus has affected the entire planet. I don't believe God caused it. I believe it's been a demonic thing from hell to bring destruction and death all over the world. And most of our families in this room have dealt with it. I've lost 15 to 20 friends to the pandemic. But what I do believe is that God will use this plague to sensitize the hearts of the world for a new move of the Holy Spirit and for a global harvest unlike anything we have ever seen in our lifetimes or before. In fact, I believe we are on the edge of the greatest revival and the greatest world evangelization any generation has ever known. And I say, come on, God, let the waves of your glory follow this plague and let us see you cover the earth for your kingdom's sake. We quote, we quote a lot, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Most of you can quote it with me. We use it all the time in America. If my people, which are called by my name. We rarely quote verse 13. Listen to verse 13 right before it. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, 
If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and will hear their land. Did you hear that? If I send a pestilence, if the locusts devour the land, if there is no rain, then if, if, if my people will humble themselves and ask me for help, I will help them. We're in one of those moments now as we started this new year. Every new year, I I pray out the old year and I pray in the new. I've done this for 40 years now in my life, a little over 42 years, just after Lisa and I got married. We we start praying about 1130, 1145, depending on the party that's going on. And we pray till about 1215 or 1230 every single new year. We pray through this time. And this year as I was praying, I, I felt like the Lord really impressed upon me that no one is sufficient for this day. And I began to pray about all the things that were on the horizon and on my schedule and things I know God is doing as well as all of my friends that are overwhelmed and feel like they're at the bottom and just so many things that night. The next couple of days then I just spent some time reflecting and I just kept chewing on this scripture and I want to leave this with you tonight. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And what I felt was that as we go into this new season following the pandemic, None of us are sufficient for what is coming on the earth. We don't have it in ourselves. The good news is our sufficiency, our capability, hallelujah, our capacity is of God. God is El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. He doesn't need anyone, need anything, and I, I need him, but he doesn't need me. So he wants me to come to him, humble myself, get rid of all of my bitterness and anger, and say, God, I love you, and I need your help in my life. So every day this year, I'm waking up saying, help, help me, Lord. God, help me, help me in my life. Help me in my family. Help me when I feel overwhelmed. Help me when I feel in bondage. Help me, help me live free. Help me live with joy. Help me live with victory. The Lord is my helper. (laughs) And he wants to be your helper as well. This afternoon as I prayed, I I think, I think, I want to be honest, I think the Lord really spoke to me about this ministry in church. And as we emerge from the pandemic, The Lord said, um, why not? Why not St. Louis? Why not this church? And the deep impression I got in my heart, Pastor Joe, was what you have seen is nothing. I want to be very clear and kind. It's nothing to what you will see. God is blessing this ministry, but I want to tell your best days, exponential days, multiplication days, overwhelmingly powerful days are ahead of you. I believe if God has his way and you humble yourself in this congregation and really keep asking for his help every single day, that God is going to use this church and this ministry to be a center of revival and renewal in the heart of the United States that will touch the earth for his glory. Wow. Oh, come on. I know that sounds weird to some of you, but I'm telling you, the Lord said to me, why not? Why not Twin Rivers? Why not St. Louis? Why not here? Why not now? Why not as we emerge from this pandemic? The Lord is coming behind the plague and God's glory is going to be seen. Just remain on your feet. Your only limiting factor... My goodness, I didn't expect to say some of this. Your only limiting factor will be your humility 
and your capacity to ask. Ask big. Ask bold. (laughs) Ask audaciously. Ask outrageously. And I hear God saying, I'm looking for someone in the heart of America who will ask me for a harvest that is a big harvest. And if I find somebody asking me, I'm going to give them an amazing harvest for my glory. You need to give God better praise than that. My, 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 my. Why not here? Why not St. Louis? Oh my gosh. This city, this region of America has been tied up for many, many years. Darkness, demonology, witchcraft, ungodliness, impurity. In fact, this city was built in many ways on ungodliness and impurity. But right in the middle where sin abounds, grace is going to much more abound. And God wants to send revival and renewal, hallelujah, in your day. So I cry tonight in this pulpit in the heart of the United States. Help, 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 help us God, help us God, help us God. Hey, what's up guys? We hope that this message you just heard blessed you. To always get our newest messages and to stay up to date, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that bell icon to be notified every time we upload. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out our page and some other messages we've got and we'll see you next time.